Shut up and sit down. Melbourne is Australia's second largest city and some expect it to become the largest within the next 10 years. The city itself is structured very much like a mashup between Adelaide and Brisbane, whereas like in Adelaide it's very flat, featureless and sandwiched between a coastal fringe and a mountain range. And like in Brisbane there's a fairly muddy river running through the centre of the CBD that flows out into a very large bay. Victoria is one of two Australian states that are predominantly fertile soil which swayed my initial expectations of the state to be more agricultural based. But once here I found that the farms are well away from the city and the majority of the activity seems to be industrial and entrepreneurial base. While riding around the fringes I could only see hobby farms within 100 odd kilometres of the CBD. Presumably large enough plots of land for efficient agricultural businesses will be too expensive anywhere near the city and much of the subdivisions to smaller rural plots happen well before the introduction of large farming equipment. The featureless nature of the city does create some interesting qualities. When looking at Sydney, where there are several large harbours and numerous beaches along its coastlines, most of the people who have the financial means will gravitate towards these more interesting suburbs and take an advantage of the views that they provide. Whereas in a flat featureless Melbourne, when there is no real motivation for the rich to congregate into one area, as the houses just look out into the neighbours' backyards, and this has created a more intermingled suburbia between the rich and the poor, without pushing the have-nots elsewhere. There are smaller pockets of richer areas, like South Yarra and Turak, which are closer to the CBD and have large obnoxious houses built on half-acre blocks. The cramped working-class areas, such as St Kilda, that are only a short walk away, and have compelled the rich to become highly antisocial, living behind 10-foot fences with security cameras everywhere. Walking through Turak, you don't want to be that guy who all of a sudden needs to take a whiz, as it's bound to be caught on camera. About 35 kilometres east of the CBD are the Dandagon Ranges. There's about 100,000 inhabitants who like to differentiate themselves from the flatland dwellers below. This small mountain range provides a bit of a getaway from the city and has a small tourist road that snakes its way through the impressive forest of tall mountain ash trees. During the winter months the range often gets dusted in snow and many of the tourist attractions such as the Alfred Nicholas Memorial Gardens which are a good example of what happens when someone has too much time and money on their hands and a love of dry stone walls. South of Melbourne is the Mornington Peninsula, which is populated by about a quarter of a million people. On a hot summer's day, Melbournians will make the near 100 odd kilometre road trip to the nearest beach that has clean enough water for them to swim in. The peninsula has a long rocky southern coastline that features Cape Shank Lighthouse, and it also has a 26 kilometre two bay walking track, which runs from the lighthouse through to the Mornington National Park and ends up at Drummana on Port Phillip Bay. The peninsula has a number of smaller rural towns such as Hastings, who support the hobby farms and scattered country retreats. The mesh of smaller acreages gives a country feel, but without the economies of scale required for any successful agricultural business. Rosebud features some of the Melbourne's famous beach boxes, which most people would know from Brighton. And to me, these beach boxes really visualize the antisocial vibe that I do get from Melbourne, as the large public change rooms typified by the Bondi pavilions, here they're just small cramped public toilets. I booked a 7pm ferry back to the mainland, which departed Tasmania from Davenport. I started the day in Queenstown, which gave me almost the entire day to travel some 200 kilometres, and the main road was just far too boring for this trip. I took the opportunity to take the detour and check out the Cornera ferry. While heading towards the Reef Dam, the main road was one of the best I'd found so far in Tassie. However, I soon turned off the main road and started heading down towards the ferry, where the dirt road soon wiped that smile from my face. Coming from New South Wales, I wasn't really expecting to pay for the ferry, but I had Google for information beforehand and failed to find any cost, but I was thankful to have a little bit of cash with me. Passing the Tarkin Hotel, I was hopeful for a quick return to the bitumen, but that was just wishful thinking. It was about a 25 kilometres of loose stones and potholes, all the way to the Savage River Mining Settlement. The Cornera Road passes through the Brennifer Ridge Conservation Area, the Pyman River State Reserve and the Meredith Range Regional Reserve. All these are on par with any dirt road through a national park that I've ever come across. Riding all through all that dirt, I was starting to worry about a flat tyre or some other breakdown on the way back to Davenport, forcing me to miss the ferry back to the mainland. Getting back to the bitumen was a welcome relief, 
as it was also being used by the mining operations, so it was a welcome 100 zone. I had to stop for a quick look at the mine as it's one of the largest I've seen in Tassie, and after peering down the massive crater left at the Mount Lewell mine in Queenstown, you can see what sort of operation will be needed to restart that one. The next 100 or kilometres for lunch at Burnie was as smooth and enjoyable as I could hope for. Thankful for the new tyres that I got in Hobart, I was now satisfied that I had seen most of Tasmania before heading back to the mainland. The northwest corner of Tassie is definitely my favourite part of the island, and stopping at Burnie for the last fish and chips before leaving the state was my way of celebrating finishing its leg of the journey. The Red Eyed Passage on the Spirit of Tasmania was scheduled to depart at 7pm, leaving me with a near six hour wait until boarding. Getting back to Davenport, I was hoping to buy some baked potatoes for dinner, but the store was still closed for the New Year's break. In hindsight, I should have grabbed some bread and salads from the supermarket before leaving. Sailing at night was a different experience, and being one of the first to check in on the day, I obviously didn't smile enough at the check-in lady who allocated me a seat in the second row. The reclining chairs are not spaced far enough apart for a six foot person to stretch out. Travelling on my own meant that I had a person either side of me, and I couldn't put my arms firmly on the armrests either. I couldn't really get any work done without either person looking over my laptop, and I soon ran out for mobile reception. The night was so uncomfortable that I didn't get much of any sleep, and I really should have moved to an open section of the ship. During the day trip to Tasmania, there was a lot more people in the open areas. During the night crossing, most of the people seemed to have organised a cabin or a reclining chair, and that left much more room in the open spaces. I think that I would have been better leaving the reclining chairs and found such an open space where I could have stretched out and got some work done. Getting back to Geelong it was about 7 in the morning, and without much of any sleep. There were no facilities on the ship to shower or otherwise freshen up. I headed out to the nearest McDonald's for some breakfast and I was very thankful that they had a clean restroom. I got to St Kilda about five hours before the check-in time for my Airbnb and with my luggage on the bike I wasn't really happy to leave it alone. I found a park on the foreshore and tried to get some work done but I was just too exhausted and I couldn't find a shaded picnic table. The day was almost totally wasted and I slept into almost midday the next day. I don't think crossing at night was that beneficial and organised a late check-in for my Airbnb for the day trip worked out much better. Of the two options, I would only cross during the day if I was ever to do it again. But if they boarded after dinner and disembarked after 8 in the morning, allowing a reasonable wake-up time, then I might reconsider. But as it stands, I was much happier travelling during the day. St Kilda is an old working class part of the city where lots of the buildings are built on small blocks of land. The place has a very similar feel to Newtown in Sydney, but in St Kilda the poor can still live here. So maybe a better cinema is closer to Fremantle in Perth. I'm staying in what feels like is a converted housing commission apartment that's barely big enough for a double bed and a desk and a chair. There's only one window and the neighbour has a habit of leaving the front door ajar just to allow some ventilation. One of the locals is riding the Yamaha R3 and locks the front disc brakes. So there's also a pretty constant smell of cannabis floating around the building. So all in all, I think I've managed to get myself a true Melbourne experience. The bike is still going strong, although I continue nurse mating it. I'm continuing to limit the revs to about 6,000 RPMs as the oil is getting fairly old and I want to wait till I get back to Sydney before arranging the next major service. The temperatures here in Melbourne are hitting nearly 40 degrees a couple of times, and with all the traffic and red lights, the bike is getting noticeably hotter riding around town. I don't know at what point I give up lugging the satellite dish around with me. Right now, it's just another lazy tax, and I'm only holding on to it because of the uncertainty. Otherwise, I broke my phone again, but it can wait until I get back to Sydney. Many of the homes around Melbourne are all crammed together on small blocks of land, with little to no front or backyards, and certainly no room for a pool. The parks are few and far between and are more like cultured gardens or long overgrown creeks. There's not much public infrastructure and the only real source of local entertainment is eating out at overpriced restaurants. Melbournians seem to eat, sleep, work and repeat. After spending two weeks here, I've realised that many of the complaints Melbournians make about Sydney are a clear case of projection. As Melbournians rich and beautiful are just too afraid to walk the streets, and then they accuse Sydney of being so fake. The only Australian city that competes with Sydney is Perth. Giving credit where credit is due, and after visiting all of Australia's major cities, 
I can say that the Victorian police are the laziest in the country. Not only do I smell more dope here in Melbourne than I did in either the Central Coast or Nimmin, but the people here pay such little attention to the road rules. For example, when I was walking past the Australian Open, I nearly got run over by an Uber driver running the red light. On the other side of the road were four police officers watching the Collingwood players train. I originally had my own personal biases against the New South Wales police, but yeah, they don't really take that crown. The weather around here is manic. It's like 15 degrees one day, 38 degrees a few days after, and then 20 degrees a day after that. A couple more days it's back up to 37 before crashing down to 15 again. With the desert heat comes from the north, it is very dry and makes it almost very dangerous to do any physical activity, while the intermittent chilly rain from the Arctic has its own difficulties. I now have a better understanding why Melburnians would jog shirtless in 15 degrees, as no one around here can predict the weather. Next stop is Barnardale, with lunch at the Tidal River. The most southern point of the Australian mainland is another 30 kilometre return hike from the Telegraph Saddle viewing platform, and I really don't think I can make it all the way there without putting myself at some serious risk. In hindsight, if I really wanted to visit all the extreme cardinal points of the Australian mainland, then I really should have bought myself a yacht. So thanks for following my adventures around Australia. Remember to go out there and do something to enjoy your day.